This is Histories and Mysteries. I'm Ashley. I'm Jessica. And I'm Rochelle. And on this week's episode, Ashley is going to be talking about the murder of Kristen Wilson. And I'm going to be talking about the Donner Party. Oh no, Jess, you broke up real bad there. Is it me? (laughs) Am I the villain? (laughs) Sorry. Is it me? I wonder why your internet's acting up and it was fine earlier. I don't know. You and shell man, your internet. I know. Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I am so excited to hear the Donner <laughs> Party. It is so fascinating. And I'm just like, I don't know a ton about it. I've read Wikipedia about it and that's about it. Cause I was like, this is interesting. Like years ago. So I am so excited to hear your story. I have never heard of this. Oh, you're going to like it, Rochelle. Kyle told me, my husband Kyle told me to do it um, a long time ago. He's like, oh, do the Donner party. And I'm like, he's like, party at five. And I'm like, I don't even know where that's from. <laughs> and knowing the story, it still doesn't make much sense. But he told me to do it forever ago. And then I watched a TikTok and they were talking about it. And so I'm like, yeah, I might as well do it. Yeah, it's super so, interesting. It's I'm very excited. So let's get through my crappy story so we can get to yours. Just kidding. My story's <laughs> okay. really good about this poor, <laughs> this, it's a sad story, but um, aren't all of mine sad murder stories. So, all right. So um, this is from a documentary I watched called Unsolved from ABC. In 1996, 20-year-old Kristen Wilson had just started her own business. She did secretarial contact work, which like, contract work which like get on you go you got your own business at 29 um she was well loved by family and friends um they had all these stories about her like one time she got her sister a ring for some celebration and like gave her little clues around the house to, like hunt down where it was um she was always like writing cards to her best friend sam he said that he had like a huge pile of these cards she would send him and you know just just the nicest girl and everybody you know just that's really so said she was just a bright light. That's so sweet. Yeah, yeah. But on Thanksgiving of 1996, this bright light was snuffed out. The family was supposed to meet Kristen at Kristen's mom's house by 2 p.m. for dinner, but Kristen didn't show, and this really wasn't like her. So the family was like, what the heck's going on? And they went over to her apartment to check on her. They saw her car was still in the parking lot. And so they knocked on the door, but nothing. And at this point, they were kind of worried. So they went to her kitchen window to peer inside and they didn't see anything. They went to her bedroom window where they saw her lying on the ground. Oh, that's the worst. Yeah. She was on her back and she was partially nude. Oh, no. Once they got into the apartment, her mom covered her with a sheet and obviously like the detectives came in and were like, you know, who did this? Like, you shouldn't have done this. She's like, you know what? I need to give my daughter some dignity. So um, after the police got there and examined the body um, and the scene, they were able to tell that Kristen fought her assailant hard. Um, One of her fingernails were broken off. She was fighting like so hard. Um, She was strangled. And her clothes were either ripped or cut off of her. Her body was left on her back. And the weird thing is her ankles were crossed and her hands were placed in her lap. Mm. Yeah. This is just like, oh, gives me the chills. This is terrifying, this next part. So police found out that the killer had been waiting for her and that the killer had planned this out. So he or she snuck in through a window Um, by loosening a screen that like they got their hand through the cat door and like loosened a screen. Um, They cut her phone cord and they unscrewed all of her light bulbs and just sat there in the dark waiting for her to get home. That's that's horrendous. Yeah. So then like, you know, when she went to go flip on a light, nothing, nothing happened. And I just, ugh. ugh. So one um, because the clothes were cut off or ripped off, uh, investigators assumed that Kristen had been raped, but during the autopsy, they didn't find any other DNA evidence um, in her or on her or around her. However, you know, the the killer could have still used a condom. Um, and this was back in like the 90s. So, you know, they didn't really have 
great testing mechanisms for that. But, um, they had two medical examiners look at her, um, and they came up with two very different reports. One said that, yes, she had been sexually assaulted. And the other one said, no, she had not. So not only, so going the, the poor police going from this, where they have two different medical examiners saying two different things. They also tested the other items at the scene, like the, the screen, the phone cord, um, and there was nothing on them. There was no fingerprints, which is what they were really focused on at the time because DNA again was still in its infancy. So, um, at the time, I don't know if they didn't, they just didn't test for DNA or they couldn't find DNA. Um, but either way, there was no DNA that they, they could use at the scene and there were no fingerprints. And so the case went cold. I hate that because so many cases have been solved now because of forensic evidence. Yeah. Mm. So it makes me sad that there was no DNA evidence. Yeah. Yeah. So the case goes cold for 25 years. And in this time, Kristen's dad died. And so he died without ever getting any answers, which is awful. But recently, Kristen's cousin, Tyler, who was only five at the time of her death, decided to really dive into her case. He said he obviously didn't know her well, but he grew up not knowing her. He said that, you know, in family gatherings like Christmas or Thanksgiving, there was a hole, there was like this hole there. Um, and he really hated that her dad died without ever knowing what happened to her. And in this age of true crime obsession, <clears throat> us, Tyler saw all of these cold cases being solved through documentaries and podcasts and thought, you know, why not us? Why couldn't we tap into these resources to find out what happened to Kristen? So the first thing Tyler did was go to an old storage shed where Kristen's mother had packed away Kristen's belongings. And one of the things they found there was a diary that kept Kristen kept. So they started looking through this diary just to see if there was any you know, any answers, anything going on at the time that they didn't know about that maybe could point to who murdered her. And on October 14th, 1993, Kristen had a diary entry that read, and that moment was the very beginning of two months of hell that I've been going through. What? Yeah. And then three years later, she was gone. So Did I she think- she have a stalker? Kind of. So I think looking back at everything that I've read, I think she was probably talking about the end of her relationship with this guy named Ted. So she was in a relationship with Ted and they moved in together in 1992. And remember, um, she was murdered in 1996. So this is quite a few years they started this relationship. But apparently he had started drinking a lot shortly after they moved in together. He was taking sleeping pills and just acting really erratically out of control. Um, and one entry she wrote um, was that she was arriving back to the town from a trip and quote, I couldn't believe that he couldn't be sober to pick me off, to pick me up. We fought a lot the first couple of days, then hardly spoke for a week. It was just too much to deal with. So obviously his drinking was an issue to her, you know. Yeah, for sure. And it's always like sad when it turns out like that, especially because she was such a nice girl. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Um, and her friend Sam gets a little into that in a bit, but, um, the post she, uh, there was another post, like the next one in the diary, it said, Ted and I had another bad fight about a week and a half ago. It was about the same things, mostly his drinking. It's not getting any better right now. He's pretending that everything is all right. If this doesn't work out with Ted, I don't think I'll ever live with another person unless I'm married. It's just too difficult to get out of a relationship when you live with someone. So Kristen's best friend at the time, um, who was more than just friends for a little bit, (laughs) um, named Sam. Um, I guess her and Sam had a quick little affair when she was with Ted, um, but nothing ever really came of it. They were just really good friends throughout the years. But Sam said that he didn't think that Ted was right for her. Um, he didn't think that he was good enough for her. And I don't know if that's because of who Ted was or if that was maybe a little jealousy on his part. You know, who knows? Um, but, 
he said that Kristen liked to rescue things. She liked to rescue cats. She liked to rescue dogs. She liked to rescue people. And he thought that Kristen was kind of trying to rescue Ted, that he was more of a project. Um, you know, all women love fixer uppers, right? Like Jessica, that's why yeah. we love Loki. Yes. <laughs> love Loki. <laughs> so does my mom. Love Bucky. Bucky's my favorite. Yeah. So Rochelle's mom, me, Jessica, we all like a little bit of fixer upper. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> now i'm just thinking about loki <laughs> so i, mean, I, I don't really... see it with tom hiddleston i just don't see, oh, I, see I i don't like i don't think tom hiddleston is attractive and i don't think loki is attractive however i love his personality and that makes him attractive to me i think both of them are hot i and think, i like their personality <laughs> i think sebastian stan is fire mm. oh yeah he's pretty yeah hot. he's delicious yeah and he's <laughs> also a broken-hearted daddy and i love him mm-hmm. yep so, yep i agree with yep, that. yep 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 okay yeah. so anyway <laughs> fix her upper so <laughs> um and Kristen's mom remembers one incident that Kristen told her about where she had to lock herself in the bathroom to get away from ted and so her mom said, well, did you call the police? And Christian was like, no. So thankfully, this kind of scary relationship didn't go further. And Christian was able to get out. And so about a year and a half before her murder, Kristen dumped Ted and moved out. But Ted didn't take it well. Kristen's mom said that Kristen called her one day and said that Ted was following her in his car and she didn't know what to do. So her mom said, come to the office, you know, I'll stay with you um, and I won't let security let him in. But apparently this wasn't an isolated incident and happened enough that even Ted's family knew he was following her. And it was also on record that he was stalking her. Uh So unfortunately, we'll never know Ted's side of the story because he died from pancreatic cancer in 2014. Um, but the documentary did say that they talked to some of his estranged family members is exactly what they said, which is interesting to me that he's estranged from his family. Um, but none of them wanted to be in the documentary and none of them knew for sure the, when was the last time that Ted had talked to Kristen. They were all like, "They're this guy's fucking weird. Right. Yeah. Like, this so guy's her, insane. Like, he's not nice, and it doesn't right. matter that he's family because he's not nice. Right, yeah. So they probably got out, too. So her next boyfriend, she started dating a year before her murder. Um, He worked in the same office of her. He was a very wealthy Scottish businessman who was 20 years older than her. So, oh, also, um, Jessica, you're going to really like this, but his name was Alistar or Alistair or whatever. Alistair. I I love that name. (laughs) Someone said he could charm the horns off a billy goat. (laughs) (laughs) But obviously no one knew about him um, because it was, you know, he was married. So it was hush hush. She didn't talk about him, not even to her sisters. Um, And, but Kristen's sister did say that right before she was murdered, Kristen said she was afraid of someone so much so that she was looking to move. But we don't know if it was Alistair because she never really spoke of him or maybe it was Ted or maybe it was someone completely else. So after Kristen's death, Alistair offered to and did pay for her funeral. He was a pallbearer. And just a few months later, he paid to have a shed built for the family. He said it was a gift. It was supposed to be a woodworking shop for Kristen's dad. So the family takes that as he feels guilty about something. Um, But I could also see it as he just really cared about her and he had a lot of money. But he also refuses to talk to anyone. I like buying a shed for the family of your like the girl you're cheating on your wife with just because she died. Like that's a very strange gift. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it is very odd. Um, but he again refused to speak with anybody, which makes sense because he's probably doesn't want to be called out. 
Um, so back in 1996, evidence processing is not what it is today. Um, and obviously DNA was not what it is today, but that these detectives, had the insight to get DNA samples from all three men in Kristen's life. So they got Ted, her best friend, Sam and Alistair, and they all agreed to go in and get their DNA match. But remember, there wasn't any DNA found at the scene. Detectives just hoped that one day these samples would help. But how was there no DNA at the scene? This question baffled tech because Kristen was strangled, which is a very personal, passionate way to kill someone with a lot of contact. And the detective said, <laughs> this, this was a quote from the detective. I'm not going to say all of those individuals that they collected samples from are cleared. All I'm going to sit here and say is just that we can't prove that any one of those have anything to do with what happened to Kristen. So come to find out the items from the crime scene were actually never even tested for DNA. So that's why there was no DNA because they were never tested for DNA. And whether this is due to poor police work or just like the realities of DNA testing at the time, I'm not sure. Um, but in, like I said earlier in 1996, they were more focused on fingerprints, which makes sense. Cause that was like the leading evidence at the time. And they didn't see any, they did fingerprint the phone cord, the screen door and scissors that were probably used to cut Kristen's clothing, but, um, they never tested it for DNA. So they, they took these things and they sent them back to the crime lab, um, to be tested for DNA. And to see if those match any of the three men in her life before she died. And that's the end of it. We are still oh, waiting those DNA results. Absolutely. What? I uh, know. No. <laughs> I hate you. I know. I was so bad. I got to the end of it and I was like, no, but I had already done the whole thing. And it- I bet it's Sam. I bet he's like the jealous but- um, that like you had no idea like comes out of left field yeah it just terrifies me to think that someone's just like sitting in your house waiting for you like that's the nightmare but Jess I'm really excited to hear your story so my story is the Donner party yay and it's a wild ride <laughs> I'm really excited it's crazy yeah, this is the one I have absolutely no idea. I can tell you what I think it's going to be, though. Okay. Um. So the Donner party, to me, sounds like a big dinner party <laughs> you know, yeah. in a creepy mansion on the hill. And <laughs> when you get there, everything, you can't leave. And then you got to do these crazy dares, like, I don't know, <laughs> dig, a, dig a key out from behind your eyeball. Yeah. <laughs> that's always what I thought it was as well um I never expected it to be what it actually is but <laughs> it's um it's a trip yeah it's so much worse than that <laughs> so much worse <laughs> so let's just dive on into it all right let's do it so at first the Donner Party pioneers were like so many others heading west in the mid-19th century In April 1846, they gathered in Springfield, Illinois, led by Jacob and George Donner and James Reed, and they prepared to leave. But unlike most westward settlers, they chose an ostensibly shorter but untested route to California, which just seems stupid to me. Yeah. And tragically, the route proved to be not only more difficult, but also fatal. The Donner Party spent so much time attempting to figure out their shortcut that they didn't arrive in California's Severa Nevada mountains until winter, and they were stranded near Truckee Lake due to a heavy snowfall. Technically, all of the roads there were untested at some point. No, well, this one was completely untested. Um, There was a route that many of the pioneers took so the path was already trodden on and it was very like well walked by that point um but because they left so late they decided hey we're going to take this shortcut but the shortcut had never actually been walked on so they had to cut down a lot of the brush themselves gotcha took up a lot more time yeah (laughs) 
The Donner Party quickly ran out of food due to their inability to move forward or back. And it didn't take long for the social order to crumble and the pioneers to give in to their hunger and resort to cannibalism. What? Yeah. <laughs> Not where you thought it was turning, right? <laughs> well, I was expecting like a party, not like a bunch <laughs> of people moving. This is a death party. <laughs> <laughs> a no pants party. No pants party. <laughs> What happened to the Donner Party at Truckee Lake has cast a long macabre shadow <laughs> over American history to this day. <laughs> you really don't want to say macabre? <laughs> no, that was yesterday's attempt. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to be attacked again. <laughs> but I had to very like specifically think it out <laughs> <laughs> on May 12 1846 the Donner Party set out west after a stop in Independence Missouri to buy provisions and gather the entire group the party of 87 pioneers was led by two brothers Jacob and George Donner and an Irish businessman named James Reed and it included men, women, and many young children. That's a lot bigger than I thought it was. I didn't realize it was that many people. I Yeah, I expected it to just be like a couple families. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a lot more people than I anticipated as well. <laughs> They'd already made a fatal mistake by that point. And to put it simply, they left too late. Pioneers like them were supposed to stick to stick to a strict schedule leaving in mid to late April to ensure that their pack animals had plenty of grass to eat before the coldest months arrived. If they left later than mid-April they risked still being on the road in the dead of winter. Quote, I am beginning to feel alarmed at the tardiness of our movements, one member of the party wrote, and fearful that winter will find us in the snowy mountains of California. Oh poor guy was exactly right. Yep. Perhaps aware of their late arrival, the oh, that's wrong. <laughs> Perhaps aware of their late departure, <laughs> the pioneers decided to take a shortcut known as the Hastings Cutoff. Despite the fact that most wagon trails looped north through Iowa, a guidebook author named Lansford Hastings suggested a more direct route existed. He, of course, named the route after himself. <laughs> but there was one problem. He had never actually taken his own path. Oh. Right. <laughs> All right, then. That's like the laziest ever. Yeah. <laughs> Fine, but they're not going to bother doing it. Yeah, but this is more direct, 100%, even though I've never done it before myself. <laughs> yeah. one of james reed's friends told him as much pleading with him not to lead the donner party down the untested path don't take this shortcut reed's friend warned him lansford hastings doesn't know what he's talking about he in fact has never taken this cut off himself i advise you strongly don't take it stick to the known california trail don't take the shortcut that's going to save you time because it won't yeah it really doesn't yeah, unfortunately, like we all know, <laughs> they didn't listen, and this ultimately led the Donner Party to their doom. The Donner Party quickly realized their error once they reached the Hastings cutoff. They had, oh God, okay, um, they had to cross the Wasatch, Wasatch, I don't know, it's W A S A T C H, Wasatch Mountains. Yeah, I don't know. And hiked across the Salt Lake Desert instead of following the well-worn paths of the California Trail. Navigating the Hastings Cutoff was difficult enough, as due to the lack of trail, the pioneers were forced to carve a path through the wilderness in order for their wagons to pass through. During the five-day journey across the Salt Desert, many people nearly died of thirst. Hmm. The worst aspect of the Hastings Cutoff was that it cut precious days off the Donner Party's journey. Because of this delay, as well as their late departure, 
They arrived in the Sierra Nevada mountains in early November. They might have made it through the mountains if they had left even a week earlier. Oh. Instead, they became stranded in a blizzard. Mm. Isn't that awful? Like one week. And yeah. You and they would have been fine. Yeah. One survivor wrote, quote, all I could see was snow everywhere. I shouted at the top of my voice. Suddenly, here and there, all about me, heads popped up through the snow. The scene was not unlike what one might imagine at the resurrection when people rise up out of the earth. The terror amounted to panic. The mules were lost, the cattle strayed away, and our further progress rendered impossible, unquote. They only had a hundred miles to go. Oh, gosh. However, the snowdrifts were as tall as 25 feet, and it was impossible to go any further. 25 mm. feet? Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. They, um, there were pictures, and they had shown tree stumps that were, like, super high mm-hmm. because that's where they cut the trees out of the snow wow yeah it was insane at this point they set up camp at Truckee lake and they hoped to survive the winter the donner party stranded in the Sierra nevadas ate everything they could because they depleted the majority of their rations on the long journey they first sorry everyone um they first slaughtered their pack animals oh. They sucked bone marrow and attempted to make an edible paste from the animal hides to stretch out the meal. The Donner Party then slaughtered field mice. Then they slaughtered and devoured each other. No, not yet. (laughs) This one's the worst. Um, Then they slaughtered and devoured their faithful dogs. Oh, no. I'd rather them slaughter each other. <laughs> you know, I kind of feel the same way too. And I feel the same way. I <laughs> feel like, what is wrong with us? <laughs> well, dogs don't bug us like people do. <laughs> I mean, if I was put in this situation, I don't know what I would do, honestly, because it's that survival mode but yeah like it's you or the dog unfortunately exactly and at this point do you know just how long they had been stranded um i believe it's from like november till april holy shit okay yeah i'm pretty sure that they first like that yeah i'm pretty sure it's till april wow i think yeah we'll get there (laughs) but it's a long time The frantic pioneers then chewed on pine cones and tree bark because they couldn't find any more animals to eat. Mm -hmm. It was insufficient, though, and it didn't go unnoticed that there was an alternative food source nearby. The bodies of those who had died, which the pioneers had buried in a snowbank. Mm -hmm. Based off of the diaries and letters from the survivors, the pioneers died of hunger and cannibalism only began during that desperate winter. A young woman named Sarah Murphy Foster hardly even had time to mourn the death of her brother before she realized that they were eating his heart. (gasps) Mm. In another, Patrick Breen recorded in his diary that, quote, Mrs. Murphy said here yesterday that thought she would immerse on milk Oh, commence on Milt and eat him. I don't that she has done so yet. It is distressing, unquote. Mm. Mm. And when wolves began to sniff around the snowbound graves of the dead pioneers, one pioneer wrote in her diary, quote, perhaps God sent the wolves to show Mrs. Murphy and also Mrs. Graves where to get sustenance for their dependent little ones. Was it culpable or cannibalistic to seek and use the only life-saving means left them? Mm. When it came to cannibalism, the Donner Party was adamant about only eating people who had already died. However, there were two tragic exemptions. Oh, no. And this is the Midwest, right? So, like, what comes next makes sense. Wait, I thought they were in California. 
or on their way to California. Oh, I thought they got stuck in the mountains of California. Yeah, but like, that's not this is early. Well, I don't know what the Midwest is. I was just thinking like Western and like the ho diggy day days. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, California is about as far west as you can go. So it's very west. <laughs> uh, it's like old Western times. Yeah, I gotcha like okay just it'll make sense <laughs> okay 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 <laughs> on december 16th a group of the donner party's most capable members decided to seek assistance their group dubbed the forlorn hope included two native americans named salvador and louis or lewis i think it's lewis the Donner Party had been joined by salvador and lewis shortly before the blizzard trapped everyone in the sierra nevadas in December, they set out with the pioneers in hopes of finding help. However, after days of marching, the forlorn help, forlorn hope, <laughs> party discovered nothing but more snow. Now, remember, the pioneers were already starving at this point, and as can be expected, they became even hungrier. One of the men in forlorn hope warned Salvador and Lewis that they may be killed and eaten. So they yeah. fled. A Californian who published a report on the Donner Party named John Sinclair explained, sometime during the night of the 4th, the Indians left them, no doubt fearful to remain, lest they might be sacrificed for food. Mm-hmm. And they were right to flee because the pioneers <gasps> followed their trail. <gasps> Which just seems like wasted energy to me at that point. Like, why would you waste energy tracking them down? But yeah. And upon discovering them collapsed from exhaustion, they killed them. <sighs> William Foster, a Donner Party member, shot them both in the head, after which they were chopped up, cooked, and consumed by the others. Their deaths were the only time the Donner Party killed someone in order to eat. So they say. So they say. But I guess if they're (laughs) going to be honest about that, they would be honest about anything else, right? Yeah. For sure. Other Donner Party cannibalism stories emphasize the fact that they only ate dead people. Despite their harrowing journey, the Forlorn Hope Party achieved their goal. After a month, they stumbled upon a ranch in California, alerting the rest of the world to the horror unfolding in the mountains. It took four relief teams two months to rescue the Donner Party survivors, and each relief team returned with harrowing tales of Donner Party cannibalism. Mm. One man described seeing a revolting and appalling spectacle at Truckee Lake that included human skeletons and every variety of mutilation. According to one account, children were seen, quote, sitting upon a log with their faces stained with blood, devouring the half roasted liver and heart of the father. (gasps) Of their own dad. You think that they could like eat each other's and not like their own family? Uh (laughs) Yeah. I doubt they were thinking that deeply. (laughs) True. 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 I just like I'm starving and are feral at that point Mm -hmm. this account went on to describe around the fire there was hair bones skulls and the fragments of half consumed limbs when one rescue team arrived at Truckee Lake they claimed to have seen a survivor Jean-Baptiste Trudeau pulling a human leg Trudeau later admitted to partaking in cannibalism During a conversation he had with H.A. Wise, who published an account of this horrible event, Trudeau admitted to eating both Jacob Donner and his four-year-old son. (gasps) Trudeau allegedly said, quote, I eat baby raw, stewed some of Jake, and roasted his head. Not good meat. Taste like sheep with the rot, but sir, very hungry, eat anything, unquote. What, was he, like something wrong with him mentally i mean like because that quote just sounds very like it's very chopped up yeah um i don't know okay i i'm like i think some of them were immigrants 
okay so maybe english wasn't their first language yeah because there's okay. another one and he is a german immigrant so. oh okay okay that makes yeah. sense i'm assuming because some of them like i mean his last name was trudeau it's a very french yeah true last name um but perhaps no daughter party cannibalism story is as chilling as lewis kesberg's Kessberg, the last person rescued from Truckee Lake in April 1847, was said to have been discovered half bad and surrounded by half-eaten bodies. Other Donner Party members recall Kessberg, a German immigrant, as being short-tempered and cruel to his young wife. I'm also thinking that, like, they probably went mad out there, right? Yeah, like, yeah. That they just said to, about Kessberg, like, they were half bad. Yeah. So, I mean, that also could have been the reason he wasn't speaking very well. Like, yeah. the other guy wasn't speaking too well. True. Rumors circulated that he once consoled a young boy before murdering him, hanging him in his cabin, and eating him. The final rescuers claimed to have discovered him with a cauldron of human flesh. They allegedly offered him food, but he declined, claiming he'd grown to prefer eating people. Another account was in regards to Margaret Reed, who stated she needed to make a Sophie's choice concerning her children when help finally arrived. There is a book called The Desperate Passage, The Daughter Party's Perilous Journey West, and it was written by a journalist named Ethan Rarick. And he used both diaries and archaeological evidence to gain invaluable insight into this tragedy, with Margaret Reed's account convincing him the project was worthwhile. He said, quote, one thing that led me to write the book is the moment when Margaret Reed is walking out with her four children with the first rescue party. It becomes clear that Patty and Tommy, ages eight and three, will not be able to keep going. They're going to have to be sent back unquote cool and then another quote says the idea that another rescue party would get him before they would starve to death is pretty unlikely Hmm. which means they're probably going to die Hmm. she has to determine is she going to send back two of her children and try to go on is she going to go with them it's like sophie's choice and she is finally convinced that she should go ahead with her two older children As they say goodbye, Patty looks at her mother and says, well, Ma, if you never see me again, just do the best you can, unquote. That's so sad. I mean, if they're going to die either way, you might as well keep trying to get them where they need to go, I would think. No, I'm pretty sure she left the two little children behind. Well, so I mean, like, so they couldn't go on because, right, they had to go back or whatever. And where they were most likely going to die. So if they were most likely Mm going to die going back and they may have died going forward, you might as well keep going forward. I don't know. No, I think that it meant like the rescue party was taking people out, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're rescuing people, but they could only take a certain amount of people at a time. And I'm pretty sure she went with the rescue party and her two older children Oh, and gotcha. left the two younger children behind so like they could only take so many people and the two younger children probably wouldn't have made it so they kept yeah. them there got it yeah. instead of yeah. taking up two spots for people who probably yes. would make it okay yeah. caught up got it i'm pretty sure that's what it was okay that makes more sense so yeah yeah <laughs> though such accounts have remained infamous for nearly two centuries actual stories of the Donner Party's cannibalism are more difficult to find. The survivors told contradictory stories and frequently changed their minds. Trudeau, for example, later denied eating anyone. However, firsthand accounts of rescuers and witnesses, as well as informed researched opinions of journalists and historians after the fact, state confidently that up to 21 people were eaten. Wow. I can see wanting to deny that, though, after you're back and safe. You just want to act like it didn't even happen. Exactly, yeah. The ghoulish aspect of cannibalism, according to Michael Wallace, author of The Best Land Under Heaven, The Donner Party, and The Age of Manifest Destiny, has greatly overshadowed the bravery and resilience inherent in the accounts of the Donner Party survivors. 
eating human flesh was a total last resort, Wallace explained. People say, oh, those cannibals, how could they do that? I turn it around and say, what would you do if you were a mother watching your children starve and freeze to death? Yeah. Well, and I think too, like, it would be, I think it would almost be stupid to let people who are alive die just so you're not eating people who are already dead like they're dead they don't they don't need their bodies anymore they're gone whatever you believe in the afterlife you know and Mm -hmm. and if they can help save someone I mean we do it all the time with organ donation you know I mean it's different like you're not eating someone but you're helping to save someone by using your body and I think that you know you're helping to say like it's awful what happened to you but you're able to help save maybe a family member like I don't know yeah what do you think Rochelle um well yeah I don't here's the thing like they know they're gonna I don't know here's the thing I don't know (laughs) (laughs) I have have, like no idea what I would do in that situation if I knew I was gonna die though I wouldn't want to prolong it by eating people yeah that's what I'll say I just like I think that if I were in that situation, it would take a lot for me to get to that mindset of, hey, I need to eat these people to survive because they could have been friends and family, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that if it was needed for survival, that you would honestly just do anything. Like you go into survival mode, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think like, I don't know, like, can you imagine just like letting yourself die when there's a, a way to keep you alive? It's just not like, yeah the best way you know what I mean it just seems kind of like yeah it's a horrible situation but why let everybody die yeah when some people could be saved you know I don't know for sure and I think that like when you have your children with you too it's a whole different yeah ball game right (laughs) Wallace contends that there was no black and white in the Donner party only gray The pioneers were in desperate need. Many of them were mothers with young children, and they did whatever it took to keep their families alive while trapped in the mountains. Some of them never spoke of it again, Wallace noted, and some denied it, but not that many. So, over 40 people survived the doomed expedition of the Donner Party, but what happened after they were rescued in 1847? Yeah, what happened? I will tell you. (laughs) In the spring of 1847, the last rescue party finally arrived. In the years since, the California Mountain Settlement has been dubbed Cannibal Camp, and the nearby lake that served as their final resting place has been dubbed Donner Lake. Survivors bore the scars of their experience for the rest of their lives, with the media and their own nightmares constantly reminding them of their tragedy. This is what happened to the Donner Party's remaining survivors. Out of the 45 survivors, 32 of them were children. As Donner Party survivor, 12-year-old Patty Reed wrote to her cousin in 1847, Oh, Mary, I have not wrote you half of the trouble we have had, but I have wrote you enough to let you know that you don't know what trouble is. Aww. Isn't that so sad? That is sad. Um, she ominously added thank god we have all got through we were the only family that did not eat human flesh oh so there was a family that didn't eat anybody the gold hill daily news reprinted the account of another donner party survivor as she told it in 1847 20 years after the tragedy oh wow quote We shall never forget the manuscript of that letter, the editor recalled. It was blotted all over with the tears which the poor girl shed while describing the sufferings of her famished parents, their death, and the flesh of their dead bodies furnishing food for their starving children. Horrible, horrible. Because many of the survivors were orphaned children, the young women and teenagers were forced to marry in order to survive. 
Mary Murphy became an orphan at the age of 13 after her parents died at the lakeside in the snowy Sierra Nevada Pass. Mary unfortunately married an abusive man three months after her rescue because she had no other choice. Poor Mary. I know. According to the indifferent stars above, she wrote in 1847, quote, I hope I shall not live long, for I am tired of this troublesome world, and I want to go to my mother, unquote. Oh. Isn't that so sad? That's so sad. After her horrible first marriage, she married Charles Coviode, a miner who founded Marysville, California, naming it after her. Another survivor, Mary Graves, 20 years old, was also left an orphan and forced to marry just three months after her rescue. Mm. However, only a year later, her husband, Edward Pyle, was murdered. Mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like this poor girl. She said, I wish I could cry, but I cannot. If I could forget the tragedy, perhaps I would know how to cry again. Hmm. And now we all remember that German immigrant, Louis Kessberg, right? Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, the third rescue party couldn't safely bring everyone back with them. So they left Kessberg and four other pioneers at the lake. Oh. But when they returned on April 17th, the only person remaining was Kessberg. (gasps) Oh. Oh, oh. oh, Casper. Upon his rescue in April, Casper allegedly admitted to cannibalizing the body of Tamson Donner, George Donner's wife, despite the fact that she was relatively healthy and had stayed behind with her husband, who was too ill to travel. Mm. The rumor circulated that he had murdered her in order to consume her. Mm. And many rumors circulated that Casper boasted about eating human flesh and that Tamson Donner's liver was the sweetest morsel he'd ever tasted. Ew. Ugh. In the 1870s, an author researching the scandal discovered Casper in poverty and despair. The man's reputation had tormented and ostracized him, leaving him widowed and responsible for two mentally challenged daughters. Hmm. That author arranged for two Donner Party survivors to reunite. Eliza Donner, who was four years old when her mother Tamsin sent her away with a rescue party, and Kessberg, the man accused of murdering her mother. Why would you put those two together? That's just mean. Right? Kessberg fell to his knees at their reunion and swore he didn't kill Tamsin, though he wouldn't deny eating her remains. Eliza forgave him, but many still believe Kessberg was the inhuman murderer that rumors claimed he was. Eliza Donner, who was only four years old at the time, was one of the last Donner Party survivors to be rescued from Donner Lake. Donner and her surviving sisters raised each other until 1861 when she married Sherman Otis Houghton, the widower of another Donner Party survivor. Hmm. Houghton went on to become mayor of San Jose and a U.S. congressman, and Eliza went on to write a book about the demise of the Donner Party. Oh, good for them. Yeah. Who better than survivors knew the heart-rending circumstances of life and death in those mountain camps, she reported. In 1911, she published The Expedition of the Donner Party and its tragic fate. And only two families made it through the Donner Party unscathed. The Breens, who refused to share their supplies with others, and the Reeds. After a fellow Donner Party member was stabbed and killed by James Reed, he was expelled from the group and he made it through Donner Pass before the snows trapped his family and the rest of the pioneers. Oh, geez. Reed raised funds for a rescue expedition, which he helped lead at Sutter's Fort in California. That was nice of him. Yeah. 
The rescue mission was successful in reuniting James with his wife and four children who had relocated to San Jose. Several streets in San Jose are actually named after the Reed family members. The Donner Party survivors became famous, then infamous, following their rescue. While some denied the stories of cannibalism, at least eight survivors admitted to eating their fellow comrades. Jean-Baptiste Trudeau told fellow survivor Eliza Donner in 1884 that he had seen no cannibalism. But in 1847, Trudeau admitted to rescuers that he had eaten human flesh. When C.F. McGlashan published a history of the Donner Party in 1879, the husband of one of the Donner girls filed an injunction claiming that the book's description of cannibalism was false. However, the book was still allowed to be published. Hmm. And despite this horrific incident, many of the survivors put the winter of 1846 and 47 in the past and never looked back. And that is my story on the daughter party. That's wild. Nothing like I expected. (laughs) No, (laughs) never. I know. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's insane. I had no idea that was a thing. Yeah, me neither. And... I got my sources, obviously, from all that's interesting. Nice. Uh-huh. Yeah, they're all I used. Because <laughs> <laughs> I got to learn that all that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's such a crazy story. Like I said, it's such a psychological, like, would you, wouldn't you? But I don't think any of us will really know what we would actually do unless we were in that situation. And hopefully none of us ever will be. Yeah, I know. I like... I could never imagine. Uh, Isn't that horrible? <laughs> yeah. All right. So on that note, I I have a joke. Yes. <laughs> I have a joke too. Okay. okay. Do you want to go first? Okay, sure. Okay. <laughs> Why do seagulls fly over the ocean? Because if they they flew over the bay, they'd be bagels. Yeah. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> All right. If you're American when you go in the bathroom and American when you come out, what are you in the bathroom? European. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And I have one more. Okay. What did the fish say when he swam into a wall? I don't know. Damn. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. (laughs) That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you want more of us lovely ladies, you can find us at historiesandmysteries.ca. We are also on Instagram and Facebook at Histories and Mysteries. And if you would love to rate and review us, we would love you back because that helps us get out there more. Yeah. Tell us what you think you would have done Ooh. if you were part of the Donner Party. Yeah. And wrong. tell us what you thought the story was going to be about <laughs> when you heard the words Donner Party. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great <laughs> yeah <laughs> well thanks for listening everybody and we look forward to bringing you two new stories next week bye, bye.